Are you afraid of conventionality? Are you the type of person who finds the sinister ever present in the plastic faces, the forced smiles, the manufactured sameness of suburban communities, filled with rows of the same manufactured houses, the same picket fences, the same manicured lawns? Do you walk by groups of people who greet you pleasantly and think, as you pass, that they are secretly cursing you, plotting against you behind their hands? Do you find something inherently ominous about everyday objects, everyday tasks, and everyday conversations that seems hidden to everybody except for you? Do you sometimes wonder if the people in your life, your spouse, your children, your family, your neighbors, those friends you see at church or the grocery store, if they might even be the people you know, have they been replaced? Are they even real? True horror doesn't always take the form of an evil cleaver-wielding clown or a serial killer wearing a hockey mask. It often starts slow, grounded in real life and real situations, until gradually things start to seem a bit off, and that disquiet, that inherent menace, begins to give way to foreboding eeriness and, ultimately, fear. And few short story writers capture that kind of horror as perceptively as Shirley Jackson. The Tooth, 1949 The bus was waiting, panting heavily at the curb in front of the small bus station its great blue and silver bulk glittering in the moonlight. There were only a few people interested in the bus, and at that time of night, no one passing on the sidewalk. The one movie theater in town had finished its show and closed its doors an hour before, and all the movie patrons had been to the drugstore for ice cream and gone on home. Now the drugstore was closed and dark, another silent doorway in the long midnight street. The only town lights were the street lights, the lights in the all-night lunch stand across the street, and the one remaining counter lamp in the bus station, where the girl sat in the ticket office with her hat and coat on, only waiting for the New York bus to leave before she went home to bed. Standing on the sidewalk next to the open door of the bus, Clara Spencer held her husband's arm nervously. I feel so funny, she said. Are you all right? he asked. Do you think I ought to go with you? No, of course not, she said. I'll be all right. It was hard for her to talk because of her swollen jaw. She kept a handkerchief pressed to her face and held hard to her husband. Everything will be fine, he said heartily. By tomorrow noon, it'll all be gone. Tell the dentist if there's anything wrong, I can come right down. I feel so funny, she said, lightheaded and sort of dizzy. That's because of the dope, he said, all that codeine and the whiskey and nothing to eat all day. She giggled nervously. I couldn't comb my hair. My hand shook so. I'm glad it's dark. Try to sleep in the bus, he said. Did you take a sleeping pill? Yes, she said. They were waiting for the bus driver to finish his cup of coffee in the lunch stand. They could see him through the glass window, sitting at the counter, taking his time. I feel so funny, she said. You know, Clara, he made his voice rather weighty, as though if he spoke more seriously, his words would carry more conviction and be therefore more comforting. You know, I'm glad you're going down to New York to have Zimmerman take care of this. I'd never forgive myself if it turned out to be something serious and I let you go to this butcher up here. It's just a toothache, Clara said uneasily. Nothing very serious about a toothache. You can't tell, he said. It might be abscessed or something. I'm sure he'll have to pull it. Don't even talk like that, she said, and shivered. Well, it looks pretty bad, he said soberly, as before. 
your face so swollen and all. Don't you worry. I'm not worrying, she said. I just feel as if I were all tooth, nothing else. The bus driver got up from the stool and walked over to pay his check. Clara moved toward the bus, and her husband said, Take your time. You've got plenty of time. I just feel funny, Clara said. Listen, her husband said. That tooth's been bothering you off and on for years. It's about time something was done. You had a toothache on our honeymoon, he finished accusingly. Did I, Clara said. You know, she went on and laughed. I was in such a hurry I didn't dress properly. I have on old stockings and I just dumped everything into my good pocketbook. Are you sure you have enough money, he said. Almost twenty-five dollars, Clara said. I'll be home tomorrow. Wire if you need more, he said. The bus driver appeared in the doorway of the lunchroom. Listen, Clara said suddenly. Are you sure you'll be all right? Mrs. Lang will be over in the morning in time to make breakfast, and Johnny doesn't need to go to school if things are too mixed up. I know, he said. Mrs. Lang, she said, checking on her fingers. I called Mrs. Lang. I left the grocery order on the kitchen table. You can have the cold tongue for lunch, and in case I don't get back, Mrs. Lang will give you dinner. The cleaner ought to come about four o'clock. I won't be back, so give him your brown suit, and it doesn't matter if you forget, but be sure to empty the pockets. Wire if you need more money, he said, or call. I'll stay home tomorrow so you can call at home. Mrs. Lang will take care of the baby, she said. Or you can wire, he said. The bus driver came across the street and stood by the entrance to the bus. Goodbye, Clara said to her husband. You'll feel all right tomorrow, her husband said. It's only a toothache. I'm fine, Clara said. Don't you worry. She got on the bus and then stopped, with the bus driver waiting behind her. Milkman, she said to her husband. Leave a note telling him we want eggs. I will, her husband said. Goodbye. Goodbye, Clara said. She moved on into the bus, and behind her the driver swung into his seat. The bus was nearly empty. She went far back and sat down at the window outside which her husband waited. Goodbye, she said to him through the glass. Take care of yourself. Goodbye, he said, waving violently. The bus stirred, groaned, and pulled itself forward. Clara turned her head to wave goodbye once more and then lay back against the heavy, soft seat. Good Lord, she thought, what a thing to do. Outside, the familiar street slipped past, strange and dark and seen, unexpectedly, from the unique station of a person leaving town, going away on a bus. It isn't as though it's the first time I've ever been to New York, Clara thought indignantly. It's the whiskey and the codeine and the sleeping pill and the toothache. She checked hastily to see if her codeine tablets were in her pocketbook. They had been standing, along with the aspirin and a glass of water, on the dining room sideboard. But somewhere in the lunatic flight from her home, she must have picked them up, because they were in her pocketbook now, along with the twenty-odd dollars and her compact and comb and lipstick. She could tell from the feel of the lipstick that she had brought the old, nearly finished one, not the new one that was a darker shade and had cost two fifty. There was a run in her stocking and a hole in the toe that she never noticed at home wearing her old comfortable shoes, but which was now suddenly and disagreeably apparent inside her best walking shoes. Well, she thought, I can buy new stockings in New York tomorrow after the tooth is fixed, after everything's all right. She put her tongue cautiously on the tooth and was rewarded with a split-second crash of pain. The bus stopped at a red light and the driver got out of his seat and came back toward her. Forgot to get your ticket before, he said. I guess I was a little rushed at the last minute, she said. She found the ticket in her coat pocket and gave it to him. When do we get to New York, she asked. Five fifteen, he said. Plenty of time for breakfast. One-way ticket? I'm coming back by train, she said, 
without seeing why she had to tell him, except that it was late at night, and people isolated together in some strange prison like a bus had to be more friendly and communicative than at other times. Me? I'm coming back by bus, he said, and they both laughed, she painfully because of her swollen face. When he went back to his seat far away at the front of the bus, she lay back peacefully against the seat. She could feel the sleeping pill pulling at her. The throb of the toothache was distant now and mingled with the movement of the bus, a steady beat like her heartbeat, which she could hear louder and louder going on through the night. She put her head back and her feet up, discreetly covered with her skirt, and fell asleep without saying goodbye to the town. She opened her eyes once, and they were moving almost silently through the darkness. Her tooth was pulsing steadily, and she turned her cheek against the cool back of the seat in weary resignation. There was a thin line of lights along the ceiling of the bus and no other light. Far ahead of her in the bus she could see the other people sitting. The driver, so far away as to be only a tiny figure at the end of a telescope, was straight at the wheel, seemingly awake. She fell back into her fantastic sleep. She woke up later because the bus had stopped. The end of that silent motion through the darkness so positive a shock that it woke her stunned, and it was a minute before the ache began again. People were moving along the aisle of the bus, and the driver, turning around, said, Fifteen minutes! She got up and followed everyone else out, all but her eyes still asleep, her feet moving without awareness. They were stopped beside an all-night restaurant, lonely and lighted on the vacant road. Inside, it was warm and busy and full of people. She saw a seat at the end of the counter and sat down, not aware that she had fallen asleep again when someone sat down next to her and touched her arm. When she looked around foggily, he said, Traveling far? Yes, she said. He was wearing a blue suit, and he looked tall. She could not focus her eyes to see any more. You want coffee, he asked. She nodded, and he pointed to the counter in front of her, where a cup of coffee sat steaming. Drink it quickly, he said. She sipped at it delicately. She may have put her face down and tasted it without lifting the cup. The strange man was talking. Even farther than Samarkand, he was saying, and the waves ringing on the shore like bells. Okay, folks, the bus driver said, and she gulped quickly at the coffee, drank enough to get her back into the bus. When she sat down in her seat again, the strange man sat down beside her, it was so dark in the bus that the lights from the restaurant were unbearably glaring, and she closed her eyes. When her eyes were shut, before she fell asleep, she was closed in alone with the toothache. The flutes play all night, the strange man said, and the stars are as big as the moon, and the moon is as big as a lake. As the bus started up again, they slipped back into the darkness and only the thin thread of lights along the ceiling of the bus held them together, brought to the back of the bus where she sat along with the front of the bus where the driver sat and the people sitting there so far away from her. The lights tied them together, and the strange man next to her was saying, Nothing to do all day but lie under the trees. Inside the bus, traveling on, she was nothing. She was passing the trees and the occasional sleeping houses, and she was in the bus, but she was between here and there, joined tenuously to the bus driver by a thread of lights, being carried along without effort of her own. My name is Jim, the strange man said. She was so deeply asleep that she stirred uneasily without knowledge, her forehead against the window, the darkness moving along beside her. Then again that numbing shock, and, driven awake, she said, frightened, What's happened? It's all right, the strange man, Jim, said immediately. Come along. She followed him out of the bus. 
into the same restaurant seemingly, but when she started to sit down at the same seat at the end of the counter, he took her hand and led her to a table. Go and wash your face, he said. Come back here afterward. She went into the ladies' room, and there was a girl standing there powdering her nose. Without turning around, the girl said, Cost a nickel. Leave the door fixed so the next one won't have to pay. The door was wedged so it would not close, with half a match folder in the lock. She left it the same way and went back to the table where Jem was sitting. What do you want, she said, and he pointed to another cup of coffee and a sandwich. Go ahead, he said. While she was eating her sandwich, she heard his voice, musical and soft. And while we were sailing past the island, we heard a voice calling us. Back in the bus, Jim said, Put your head on my shoulder now and go to sleep. I'm all right, she said. No, Jim said. Before, your head was rattling against the window. Once more she slept, and once more the bus stopped, and she woke frightened, and Jim brought her again to a restaurant and more coffee. Her tooth came alive then, and with one hand pressing her cheek, she searched through the pockets of her coat and then through her pocketbook until she found the little bottle of codeine pills, and she took two while Jim watched her. She was finishing her coffee when she heard the sound of the bus motor, and she started up suddenly, hurrying, and with Jem holding her arm, she fled back into the dark shelter of her seat. The bus was moving forward when she realized that she had left her bottle of codeine pills sitting on the table in the restaurant, and now she was at the mercy of her tooth. For a minute, she stared back at the lights of the restaurant through the bus window, and then she put her head on Jem's shoulder and he was saying as she fell asleep, The sand is so white, it looks like snow, but it's hot. Even at night, it's hot under your feet. Then they stopped for the last time, and Jem brought her out of the bus, and they stood for a minute in New York together. A woman passing them in the station said to the man following her with suitcases, We're just on time, it's 5.15. I'm going to the dentist, she said to Jem. I know, he said. I'll watch out for you. He went away, although she did not see him go. She thought to watch for his blue suit going through the door, but there was nothing. I ought to have thanked him, she thought stupidly, and went slowly into the station restaurant where she ordered coffee again. The counterman looked at her with the worn sympathy of one who has spent a long night watching people get off and on buses. Sleepy? he asked. Yes, she said. She discovered after a while that the bus station joined a Pennsylvania terminal, and she was able to get into the main waiting room and find a seat on one of the benches by the time she fell asleep again. Then someone shook her rudely by the shoulder and said, what train you taking, lady? It's nearly seven. She sat up and saw her pocketbook on her lap, her feet neatly crossed, a clock glaring into her face. She said, thank you, and got up and walked blindly past the benches and got on to the escalator. Someone got on immediately behind her and touched her arm. She turned, and it was Jem. The grass is so green and so soft he said, smiling, and the water of the river is so cruel. She stared at him tiredly. When the escalator reached the top, she stepped off and started to walk to the street she saw ahead. Jem came along beside her, and his voice went on. The sky is bluer than anything you've ever seen, and the songs. She stepped quickly away from him and thought that people were looking at her as they passed. She stood on the corner waiting for the light to change, and Jem came swiftly up to her and then away. Look, he said as he passed, and he held out a handful of pearls. Across the street there was a restaurant just opening. She went in and sat down at a table, and a waitress was standing beside her, frowning. 
You was asleep, the waitress said accusingly. I'm very sorry, she said. It was morning. Poached eggs and coffee, please. It was a quarter to eight when she left the restaurant, and she thought, if I take a bus and go straight downtown now, I can sit in the drugstore across from the street from the dentist's office and have more coffee until about 8.30 and then go into the dentist when it opens and he can take me first. The buses were beginning to fill up. She got into the first bus that came along and she could not find a seat. She wanted to go to 23rd Street and got a seat just as they were passing 26th Street. When she woke, she was so far downtown that it took her nearly half an hour to find a bus and get back to 23rd. At the corner of 23rd Street, while she was waiting for the light to change, she was caught up in a crowd of people, and when they crossed the street and separated to go different directions, someone fell into step beside her. For a minute, she walked on without looking up, staring resentfully at the sidewalk, her tooth burning her. And then she looked up, but there was no blue suit among the people pressing by on either side. When she turned into the office building where her dentist was, it was still very early morning. The doorman in the office building was freshly shaven and his hair was combed. He held the door open briskly, as at five o'clock he would be sluggish, his hair faintly out of place. She went in through the door with a feeling of achievement. She had come successfully from one place to another, and this was the end of her journey and her objective. The clean white nurse sat at the desk in the office. Her eyes took in the swollen cheek, the tired shoulders, and she said, You poor thing, you look worn out. I have a toothache. The nurse half smiled as though she were still waiting for the day when someone would come in and say, My feet hurt. She stood up into the professional sunlight. Come right in, she said. We won't make you wait. There was sunlight on the headrest of the dentist chair, on the round white table, on the drill bending its smooth chromium head. The dentist smiled with the same tolerance as the nurse. Perhaps all human ailments were contained in the teeth, and he could fix them if people would only come to him in time. The nurse said smoothly, I'll get her file, doctor. We thought we'd better bring her right in. She felt, while they were taking an x-ray, that there was nothing in her head to stop the malicious eye of the camera, as though the camera would look through her and photograph the nails in the wall next to her, or the dentist's cuff buttons, or the small, thin bones of the dentist's instruments. The dentist said, Extraction regretfully to the nurse, and the nurse said, Yes, doctor, I'll call them right away. Her tooth, which had brought her here unerringly, seemed now the only part of her to have any identity. It seemed to have had its picture taken without her. It was the important creature which must be recorded and examined and gratified. She was only its unwilling vehicle, and only as such was she of interest to the dentist and the nurse. Only as the bearer of her tooth was she worth their immediate and practiced attention. The dentist handed her a slip of paper with the picture of a full set of teeth drawn on it. Her living tooth was checked with a black mark, and across the top of the paper was written, Lower Molar Extraction. Take this slip, the dentist said, and go right up to the address on this card. It's a surgeon dentist. They'll take care of you there. What will they do, she said. Not the question she wanted to ask, not, what about me, or how far down do the roots go? They'll take that tooth out, the dentist said testily, turning away. Should have been done years ago. I've stayed too long, she thought. He's tired of my tooth. She got up out of the dentist's chair and said, thank you, goodbye. Goodbye, the dentist said. At the last minute, he smiled at her, showing her his full white teeth, all in perfect control. Are you all right? Does it bother you too much? I'm all right. I can give you some codeine tablets, the nurse said. We'd rather you didn't take anything right now, of course, but I think I could let you have them if the tooth is really bad. No, she said, remembering her little bottle of codeine pills on the table of a restaurant between here and there. 
No, it doesn't bother me too much. Well, the nurse said, good luck. She went down the stairs and out past the doorman. In the fifteen minutes she had been upstairs, he had lost a little of his pristine morningness, and his bow was just a fraction smaller than before. Taxi? he asked, and remembering the bus down to 23rd Street, she said yes. Just as the doorman came back from the curb, bowing to the taxi he seemed to believe he had invented, she thought a hand waved to her from across the street. She read the address on the card the dentist had given her and repeated it carefully to the taxi driver. With the card and the little slip of paper with lower molar written on it and her tooth identified so clearly, she sat without moving, her hands still around the paper, her eyes almost closed. She thought she must have been asleep again when the taxi stopped suddenly and the driver, reaching around to open the door, said, Here we are, lady. He looked at her curiously. I'm going to have a tooth pulled, she said. Jesus, the taxi driver said. She paid him and he said, good luck, as he slammed the door. This was a strange building, the entrance flanked by medical signs carved in stone. The doorman here was faintly professional, as though he were competent to prescribe if she did not care to go any farther. She went past him, going straight ahead until an elevator opened its door to her. In the elevator, she showed the elevator man the card and he said, Seventh floor. He had to back up in the elevator for a nurse to wheel in an old lady in a wheelchair. The old lady was calm and restful, sitting there in the elevator with a rug over her knees. She said, Nice day, to the elevator operator, and he said, Good to see the sun. And then the old lady lay back in her chair, and the nurse straightened the rug around her knees and said, Now we're not going to worry. And the old lady said irritably, Who's worrying? They got out at the fourth floor. The elevator went on up, and then the operator said, Seven, and the elevator stopped and the door opened. Straight down the hall and to your left, the operator said. There were closed doors on either side of the hall. Some of them said DDS, and some of them said clinic, some of them said X-ray. One of them, looking wholesome and friendly and somehow most comprehensible, said ladies. Then she turned to the left and found a door with the name on the card, and she opened it and went in. There was a nurse sitting behind a glass window, almost as in a bank and potted palms and tubs in the corners of the waiting room, and new magazines and comfortable chairs. The nurse behind the glass window said, Yes, as though you had overdrawn your account with the dentist and were two teeth in arrears. She handed her slip of paper through the glass window, and the nurse looked at it and said, Lower molar, yes. They called about you. Will you come right in, please, through the door to your left? Into the vault, she almost said and then silently opened the door and went in. Another nurse was waiting, and she smiled and turned, expecting to be followed, with no visible doubt about her right to lead. There was another x-ray, and the nurse told another nurse, Lower molar, and the other nurse said, Come this way, please. There were labyrinths and passages, seeming to lead into the heart of the office building, and she was put finally, in a cubicle where there was a couch with a pillow and a wash basin and a chair. Wait here, the nurse said. Relax if you can. I'll probably go to sleep, she said. Fine, the nurse said. You won't have to wait long. She waited, probably, for over an hour, although she spent the time half sleeping, waking only when someone passed the door. Occasionally, the nurse looked in and smiled. Once, she said, won't have to wait much longer. Then, suddenly, the nurse was back, no longer smiling, no longer the good hostess, but efficient and hurried. Come along, she said, and moved purposefully out of the little room into the hallways again. Then, quickly, more quickly than she was able to see, she was sitting in the chair, and there was a towel around her head, and a towel under her chin, and the nurse was leaning a hand on her shoulder. Will it hurt? she asked. No, the nurse said, smiling. You know it won't hurt, don't you? Yes, she said. The dentist came in and smiled down on her from over her head. 
Well, he said. Will it hurt? She said. Now, he said cheerfully, we couldn't stay in business if we hurt people. All the time he talked, he was busying himself with metal hidden under a towel and great machinery being wheeled in almost silently behind her. We couldn't stay in business at all, he said. All you've got to worry about is telling us all your secrets while you're asleep. Want to watch out for that, you know. Lower molar, he said to the nurse. Lower molar, doctor, she said. They put the metal-tasting rubber mask over her face, and the dentist said, you know, two or three times absent-mindedly, while she could still hear him over the mask. The nurse said, relax your hands, dear, and after a long time she felt her fingers relaxing. First of all, things get so far away, she thought, remember this, and remember the metallic sound and taste of all of it, and the outrage. And then the whirling music, the ringing, confusedly loud music that went on and on, around and around, and she was running as fast as she could down a long, horribly clear hallway with doors on both sides, and at the end of the hallway was Jim, holding out his hands and laughing and calling something she could never hear because of the loud music. And she was running, and then she said, I'm not afraid and someone from the door next to her took her arm and pulled her through, and the world widened alarmingly until it would never stop, and then it stopped, with the head of the dentist looking down at her, and the window dropped into place in front of her, and the nurse was holding her arm. Why did you pull me back, she said, and her mouth was full of blood. I wanted to go on. I didn't pull you, the nurse said. But the dentist said, she's not out of it yet. She began to cry without moving and felt the tears rolling down her face and the nurse wiped them off with a towel. There was no blood anywhere around except in her mouth. Everything was as clean as before. The dentist was gone suddenly and the nurse put out her arm and helped her out of the chair. Did I talk? She asked suddenly, anxiously. Did I say anything? You said I'm not afraid, the nurse said soothingly, just as you were coming out of it. No, she said, stopping to pull at the arm around her. Did I say anything? Did I say where he is? You didn't say anything, the nurse said. The doctor was only teasing you. Where's my tooth, she asked suddenly. And the nurse laughed and said, all gone, never bother you again. She was back in the cubicle and she lay down on the couch and cried, and the nurse brought her whiskey in a paper cup and set it on the edge of the wash basin. God has given me blood to drink, she said to the nurse, and the nurse said, don't wrench your mouth or it won't clot. After a long time, the nurse came back and said to her from the doorway, smiling, I see you're awake again. Why, she said. You've been asleep, the nurse said. I didn't want to wake you. She sat up. She was dizzy, and it seemed that she had been in the cubicle all her life. Do you want to come along now, the nurse said, all kindness again. She held out the same arm, strong enough to guide any wavering footstep. This time, they went back through the long corridor to where the nurse sat behind the bank window. All through, this nurse said brightly. Sit down a minute, then. She indicated a chair next to the glass window and turned away to write busily. Do not wrench your mouth for two hours, she said without turning around. Take a laxative tonight. Take two aspirin if there is any pain. If there is much pain or excessive bleeding, notify this office at once. All right, she said and smiled brightly again. There was a new little slip of paper. This one said extraction and underneath do not rinse mouth, take mild laxative, two aspirin for pain. If pain is excessive or any hemorrhage occurs, notify office. Goodbye, the nurse said pleasantly. Goodbye, she said. With the little slip of paper in her hand, she went out through the glass door and, still almost asleep, turned the corner and started down the hall. When she opened her eyes a little and saw that it was a long hall with doorways on either side, she stopped and then saw the door marked ladies and went in. 
Inside, there was a vast room with windows and wicker chairs and glaring white tiles and glittering silver faucets. There were four or five women around the wash basins, combing their hair, putting on lipstick. She went directly to the nearest of the three wash basins, took a paper towel, dropped her pocketbook and the little slip of paper on the floor next to her, and fumbled with the faucets, soaking the towel until it was dripping. Then she slapped it against her face violently. Her eyes cleared and she felt fresher, so she soaked the paper again and rubbed her face with it. She felt out blindly for another paper towel, and the woman next to her handed her one with a laugh she could hear, although she could not see for the water in her eyes. She heard one of the women say, Where are we going for lunch? And another one say, Just downstairs, probably. Old fool says I gotta be back in a half an hour. Then she realized that at the wash basin, she was in the way of the women in a hurry, so she dried her face quickly. It was when she stepped a little aside to let someone else get to the basin and stood up and glanced into the mirror that she realized with a slight stinging shock that she had no idea which face was hers. She looked into the mirror as though into a group of strangers, all staring at her or around her. No one was familiar in the group. No one smiled at her or looked at her with recognition. You'd think my own face would know me, she thought, with a queer numbness in her throat. There was a creamy, chinless face with bright blonde hair and a sharp-looking face under a red-veiled hat and a colorless, anxious face with brown hair pulled straight back and a square, rosy face under a square haircut and two or three more faces pushing close to the mirror, moving, regarding themselves. Perhaps it's not a mirror, she thought. Perhaps it's a window, and I'm looking straight through at women washing on the other side. But there were women combing their hair and consulting the mirror. The group was on her side, and she thought, I hope I'm not the blonde, and lifted her hand and put it on her cheek. She was the pale, anxious one with the hair pulled back, and when she realized it, she was indignant and moved hurriedly back through the crowd of women, thinking, it isn't fair. Why don't I have any color in my face? There were some pretty faces there. Why didn't I take one of those? I didn't have time, she told herself sullenly. They didn't give me time to think. I could have had one of the nice faces. Even the blonde would be better. She backed up and sat down in one of the wicker chairs. It's mean, she was thinking. She put her hand up and felt her hair. It was loosened after her sleep, but that was definitely the way she wore it, pulled straight back all around and fastened at the back of her neck with a wide, tight beret. Like a schoolgirl, she thought, only remembering the pale face in the mirror. Only I'm older than that. She unfastened the beret with difficulty and brought it around where she could look at it. Her hair fell softly around her face. It was warm and reached to her shoulders. The beret was silver. Engraved on it was the name Clara. Clara, she said aloud. Clara? Two of the women leaving the room smiled back at her over their shoulders. Almost all the women were leaving now, correctly combed and lipsticked, hurrying out, talking together. In the space of a second, like birds leaving a tree, they were all gone, and she sat alone in the room. She dropped the beret into the ash stand next to her. The ash stand was deep and metal, and the beret made a satisfactory cling falling down. Her hair down on her shoulders, she opened her pocketbook and began to take things out, setting them on her lap as she did so. Handkerchief, plain, white, uninitialed, compact, square and brown tortoiseshell plastic with a powder compartment and a rouge compartment. The rouge compartment had obviously never been used, although the powder cake was half gone. That's why I'm so pale, she thought, and set the compact down. Lipstick, a rose shade, almost finished, a comb, an open packet of cigarettes, and a package of matches, a change purse, and a wallet. The change purse was red imitation leather with a zipper across the top. She opened it and dumped the money out into her hand. 
Nickels, dimes, pennies, a quarter. Ninety-seven cents. Can't go far on that, she thought, and opened the brown leather wallet. There was money in it, but she looked first for papers and found nothing. The only thing in the wallet was money. She counted it. There he was nineteen dollars. I can go on a little farther on that, she thought. There was nothing else in the pocketbook. No keys. Shouldn't I have keys, she wondered. No papers, no address book, no identification. The pocketbook itself was imitation leather, light gray, and she looked down and discovered that she was wearing a dark gray flannel suit and a salmon pink blouse with a ruffle around the neck. Her shoes were black and stout with moderate heels, and they had laces, one of which was untied. She was wearing beige stockings, and there was a ragged tear in the right knee and a great ragged run going down her leg and ending in a hole in the toe which she could feel inside her shoe. She was wearing a pin on the lapel of her suit, which, when she turned it around to look at it, was a blue plastic letter C. She took the pen off and dropped it into the ash stand, and it made a sort of clatter at the bottom with a metallic clang when it landed on the beret. Her hands were small, with stubby fingers and no nail polish. She wore a thin gold wedding ring on her left hand and no other jewelry. Sitting alone in the ladies' room in the wicker chair, she thought, the least I can do is get rid of these stockings. Since no one was around, she took off her shoes and stripped away the stockings with a feeling of relief when her toe was released from the hole. Hide them, she thought, the paper towel waste basket. When she stood up, she got a better sight of herself in the mirror. It was worse than she had thought. The gray suit bagged in the seat. Her legs were bony and her shoulders sagged. I look fifty, she thought, and then, consulting the face, but I can't be more than thirty. Her hair hung down untidily around the pale face, and with sudden anger she fumbled in the pocketbook and found the lipstick. She drew an emphatic rosy mouth on the pale face, realizing as she did so that she was not very expert at it, and with the red mouth the face looking at her seemed somehow better to her. So she opened the compact and put on pink cheeks with the rouge. The cheeks were uneven and patent, and the red mouth glaring, but at least the face was no longer pale and anxious. She put the stockings into the wastebasket and went bare-legged out into the hall again, and purposefully to the elevator. The elevator operator said down when he saw her, and she stepped in, and the elevator carried her silently downstairs. She went back past the grave professional doorman and out into the street where people were passing, and she stood in front of the building and waited. After a few minutes, Jem came out of a crowd of people passing and came over to her and took her hand. Somewhere between here and there was her bottle of codeine pills. Upstairs on the floor of the ladies' room, she had left a little slip of paper headed extraction. Seven floors below, oblivious of the people who stepped sharply along the sidewalk, not noticing their occasional curious glances, her hand in Jem's and her hair down on her shoulders. She ran barefoot through hot sand. The Very Strange House Next Door, 1959 I don't gossip. If there is anything in this world I loathe, it is gossip. A week or so ago in the store, Dora Powers started to tell me that nasty rumor about the Harris boy again, and I came right out and said to her if she repeated one more word of that story to me, I wouldn't speak to her for the rest of my life, and I haven't. It's been a week, and not one word have I said to Dora Powers, and that's what I think of gossip. Tom Harris has always been too easy on that boy anyway. The young fella needs a good whipping, and he'd stop all this ranting around, and I've said so to Tom Harris a hundred times or more. 
If I didn't get so mad when I think about that house next door, I'd almost have to laugh seeing people in town standing in the store and on corners and dropping their voices to talk about fairies and leprechauns when every living one of them knows there isn't any such thing and never has been, and them just racking their brains to find new tales to tell. I don't hold with gossip, as I said, even if it's about leprechauns and fairies. And it's my held opinion that Jane Dollar is getting feeble in the mind. Ah, oh, the Dollars weren't ever noted for keeping their senses right up to the end, anyway. And Jane's no older than her mother when she sent a cake to the bake sale and forgot to put the eggs in it. Some said she did it on purpose to get even with the ladies for not asking her to take a booth, but most just said the old lady had lost track of things, and I dare say she could have looked out and seen fairies in her garden if it had ever came into her mind. When the Dollars get that age, they'll tell anything. And that's right where Jane Dollar is now, give or take six months. My name is Addie Spinner, and I live down on Main Street, the last house but one. There's just one house after mine, and then Main Street kind of runs off into the woods. Spinner's Thicket, they call the woods, on account of my grandfather building the first house in the village before the crazy people moved in. The house past mine belonged to the Bartons, but they moved away because he got a job in the city, and high time, too, after them living off her sister and her husband for upward of a year. Well, after the Bartons finally moved out, owing everyone in town, if you want my guess, it wasn't long before the crazy people moved in, and I knew they were crazy right off when I saw that furniture. I already knew they were young folks, and probably not married long, because I saw them when they came to look at the house. Then, when I saw the furniture go in, I knew there was going to be trouble between me and her. The moving van got to the house about 8 in the morning. Of course, I always had my dishes done and my house swept up long before that, so I took my mending for the poor out on the side porch and really got caught up on a lot I'd been letting slide. It was a hot day, so I just fixed myself a salad for lunch. And the side porch is a nice, cool place to sit and eat on a hot day, so I never missed a thing going into that house. First, there were the chairs, all modern with no proper legs or seats. And I always say that a woman who buys herself that flyaway kind of furniture has no proper feeling for her house. For one thing, it's too easy to clean around those little thin legs. You can't get a floor well swept without a lot of hard work. Then, she had a lot of low tables, and you can't fool me with them. When you see those little low tables, you can always tell there's going to be a lot of drinking liquor going on in that house. Those little tables are made for people who give cocktail parties and need a lot of places to put glasses down. Hattie Martin, she has one of those low tables, and the way Martin drinks is a crime. Then, when I saw the barrels going in next door, I was sure... And no one married has that many dishes without a lot of cocktail glasses, and you just can't tell me any different. Uh, when I went down to the store later, after they were all moved in, I met Jane Dollar, and I told her about the drinking that was going to be going on next door, and she said to me she wasn't a bit surprised because the people had a maid. Not someone to come in one day a week and do the heavy cleaning. A maid. Lived in the house and everything. I said I hadn't noticed any maid, and Jane said most things, if I hadn't noticed them, she wouldn't believe they existed in this world. But the West's maid was sure enough. She'd been in the store not ten minutes earlier buying a chicken. We didn't think she'd rightly have enough time to cook a chicken before supper time, but then we decided that probably the chicken was for tomorrow, and tonight the West's were planning on going over to the inn for dinner, and the maid could fix herself an egg or something. Jane did say that one trouble with having a maid, and Jane never had a maid in her life, and I wouldn't speak to her if she did, was that you never had anything left over. No matter what you planned, you had to get new meat every day. I looked around for the maid on my way home. The quickest way to get to my house from the store is to take the path that cuts across the back garden of the house next door, and even though I don't use it generally, you don't meet neighbors to pass the time of day with going along a back path. I thought I'd better be hurrying a little to fix my own supper, so I cut across the West's back garden. West, 
uh, that was their name, and what the maid was called, I don't know, because Jane hadn't been able to figure that out. It was a good thing I did take that path, because there was the maid, right out there in the garden, down on her hands and knees, digging. Good evening, I said, just as polite as I could. It's kind of damp to be down on the ground. I don't mind, she said. I like things that grow. I must say she was a pleasant speaking woman, although too old, I'd think, for domestic work. The poor thing must have been in sad straits to hire out, and yet here she was, just as jolly and round as an apple. I thought maybe she was an old aunt or something, and they took this way of keeping her. So I said, still very polite, I see you just moved in today. Yes, she said, not really telling me much. The family's name is West? Yes. You might be Mrs. West's mother. No. An aunt, possibly. No. Not related at all? No. You're just the maid. I thought afterward that she might not like it mentioned, but once it was out, I couldn't take it back. Yes, she answered pleasant enough. I will say that for her. The work is hard, I expect. No. Just the two of them to care for? Yes. I'd say you wouldn't like it much. It's not bad, she said. I use magic a lot, of course. Magic, I said. Does that get your work done sooner? Indeed it does, she said, with not so much as a smile or a wink. You wouldn't think, would you, that right now I'm down on my hands and knees making dinner for my family. No, I said. I wouldn't think that. See, she said, here's our dinner. And she showed me an acorn. I swear she did, with a mushroom and a scrap of grass in it. It hardly looks like enough to go around, I said, kind of backing away. She laughed at me, kneeling there on the grass with her acorn, and said, If there's any left over, I'll bring you a dish. You'll find it wonderfully filling. But what about your chicken, I said. I was well along the path away from her, and I did want to know why she got the chicken if she didn't think that they were going to eat it. Oh, that, she said, that's for my cat. Well, who buys a whole chicken for a cat that shouldn't have chicken bones anyway? Like I told Jane over the phone as soon as I got home, Mr. Honeywell down at the store ought to refuse to sell it to her, or at least make her take something more fitting, like ground meat, even though neither of us believed for a minute that the cat was really going to get the chicken, or that she even had a cat, come to think of it. Crazy people will say anything that comes into their heads. I know for a fact that no one next door ate chicken that night, though. See, my kitchen window overlooks their dining room if I stand on a chair, and what they ate for dinner was something steaming in a big brown bowl. I had to laugh thinking about that acorn, because that was just what the bowl looked like. A big acorn. Probably, that was what put the notion in her head. And sure enough, later she brought over a dish of it and left it on my back steps. Me not wanting to open the door late at night with a crazy lady outside. And like I told Jane, I certainly wasn't going to eat any outlandish concoction made by a crazy lady. But I kind of stirred it around with the end of a spoon, and it smelled all right. It had mushrooms in it and beans, but I couldn't tell what else. And Jane and I decided that probably we were right the first time and the chicken was for tomorrow. Now, I had to promise Jane I'd try to get a look inside to see how they set out that fancy furniture. So next morning, I brought back their bowl and marched right up to the front door. Mostly around town, we go in and out back doors, but being as they were new, and especially since I wasn't sure how you went about calling when people had a maid, I used the front and gave a knock. I had gotten up so early to make a batch of donuts, so I'd have something to put in the bowl when I took it back. So I knew that the people next door were up and about because I saw him leaving for work at 7.30. He must have worked in the city to have got off so early. Jane thinks he's in an office because she saw him going toward the depot and he wasn't running. People who work in offices don't have to get in on the dot, Jane said, although how she would know, I couldn't tell you. Now, it was little Mrs. West who opened the door, and I must say she looked agreeable enough. I thought with the maid to bring her breakfast and all, she might still be lying in bed the way they do. 
but she was all dressed in a pink house dress and was wide awake. She didn't ask me in right away, so I kind of moved a little toward the door, and then she stepped back and said, wouldn't I come in? And I must say, funny as that furniture is, she had it fixed up nice, with green curtains on the windows. I couldn't tell from my house what the pattern was on those curtains, but once I was inside, I could see it was a pattern of green leaves kind of woven in, and the rug, which of course I had seen when they brought it in, was green too. Some of those big boxes that went in must have held books because there were a lot of books all put away in bookcases. And before I had a chance to think, I said, my, you must have worked all night to get everything arranged so quick. I didn't see your lights on though. Mally did it, she said. Mally being the maid. She kind of smiled and then she said, she's more like a godmother than a maid, really. I do hate to seem curious, so I just said, Mally must keep herself pretty busy. Yesterday she was out digging in your garden. Yes. It was hard to glean anything out of these people with their short answers. I brought you some donuts, I said. Thank you. She put the bowl down on one of those little tables. Jane thinks they must hide the wine because there wasn't a sight of any such thing that I could see. And then she said, we'll offer them to the cat. Well, I can tell you I didn't much care for that. You must have quite a hungry cat, I said to her. Yes, she said. I don't know what we'd do without him. It, he's Mally's cat, of course. Well, I haven't seen him, I said. If we were going to talk about cats, I figured I could hold my own, having had one cat or another for a matter of 60 years, although it hardly seemed a sensible subject for two ladies to chat over. Uh, like I told Jane, there was a lot she ought to be wanting to know about the village and the people in it and who to go to for hardware and whatnot. And I know for a fact I've put a dozen people off Tom Harris's hardware store since he charged me 17 cents for a pound of nails, and I was just the person to set her straight on the town. But she was going on about the cat. Fond of children, she was saying. I expect he's company for Mally, I said. Well, he helps her too, you know, she said. And then I began to think maybe she was crazy too. And how does the cat help Mally? with her magic. I see, I said, and I started to say goodbye fast, figuring to get home to the telephone, because people around the village certainly ought to be hearing about what was going on. But before I could get to the door, the maid came out of the kitchen and said good morning to me, real polite. And then the maid said to Mrs. West that she was putting together the curtains for the front bedroom, and would Mrs. West like to decide on the pattern? And while I just stood there with my jaw hanging, she held out a handful of cobwebs. And I never did see anyone before or since who was able to hold a cobweb pulled out neat, or anyone who would want to for that matter. And she had a blue jay's feather and a curl of blue ribbon. And she asked me how I liked her curtains. Well, that did it for me. And I got out of there and ran all the way back to Jane's house. And of course, she never believed me. She walked me home just so that she could get a look at the outside of the house. And I will be everlastingly shaken if they hadn't gone and put up the curtains in that front bedroom. Soft white net with a design of blue that Jane said looked like a blue jay's feather. Jane said that they were the prettiest curtains she ever saw. But they gave me the shivers every time I looked at them. It wasn't two days after that that I began finding things, uh, little things, and even some inside my own house. Once there was a basket of grapes on my back steps, and I swear those grapes were never grown around our village. For one thing, they shone like they were covered with silver dust and smelled like some foreign perfume. I threw them in the garbage, but I kept a little embroidered handkerchief I found on the table in my front hall, and I've still got it in my dresser drawer. Once, I found a colored thimble on my fence post, and once my cat, Samantha, that I've had for 11 years and more, came in wearing a little green collar and spat at me when I took it off. One day, 
I found a leaf basket on my kitchen table filled with hazelnuts, and it made me downright shaken mad to think of someone's coming in and out of my house without so much as asking, and me never seeing them come or go. Things like that never happened before the crazy people moved into the house next door, and I was telling Mrs. Acton so, down on the corner one morning, when young Mrs. O'Neill came by and told us that when she was in the store with her baby, she met Mally the maid. See, the baby was crying because he had a time with his teething, and Mally gave him a little green candy to bite on. We thought Mrs. O'Neill was crazy herself to let her baby have candy that came from that family, and said so and I told them about the drinking that went on and the furniture getting arranged in the dark and the digging in the garden and Mrs. Acton said she certainly hoped they weren't going to think that just because they had a garden they had any claim to be in the garden club. Mrs. Acton is president of the garden club. Uh, Jane says I ought to be president if things were done right on account of having the oldest garden in town, but Mrs. Acton's husband is the doctor, and I don't know what people thought he might do to them when they were sick if Mrs. Acton didn't get to be president. Anyway, you'd think Mrs. Acton had some say about who got into the garden club and who didn't, but I had to admit that in this case, we'd all vote with her, even though Mrs. O'Neill did tell us the next day that she didn't think the people could be all that crazy because the baby's tooth came through that night with no more trouble. Do you know, all this time that maid came into the store every day and every day she bought one chicken, nothing else. Jane took to dropping in the store when she saw the maid going along and she says the maid never bought but one chicken a day. Once Jane got her nerve up and said to the maid that they must be fond of chicken, and the maid looked straight at her and told her right to her face that they were vegetarians. All but the cat, I suppose, Jane said, being pretty nervy when she gets her nerve up. Yes, the maid said, all but the cat. We finally decided that he must bring food home from the city, although why Mr. Honeywell's store wasn't good enough for them, I couldn't tell you. After the baby's tooth was better, Tom O'Neill took them over a batch of fresh-picked sweet corn, and they must have liked that, because they sent the baby a furry blue blanket that was so soft that young Mrs. O'Neill said the baby never needed another, winter or summer, and after being so sickly, that baby began to grow and got so healthy, you wouldn't know it was the same one even though the O'Neills never should have accepted presents from strangers, not knowing whether the wool might be clean or not. Then I found out they were dancing next door. Night after night after night, dancing. Sometimes I'd lie there awake until 10, 11 o'clock, listening to that heathen music and wishing I could get up the nerve to go over and give them a piece of my mind. It wasn't so much the noise keeping me from sleeping. I will say the music was soft and kind of like a lullaby, but people haven't got any right to live like that. Folks should go to bed at a sensible hour and get up at a sensible hour and spend their days doing good deeds and housework. A wife ought to cook dinner for her husband and not out of cans from the city either. And she ought to run over next door sometimes with a home-baked cake to pass the time of day and keep up with the news. And most of all, a wife ought to go to the store herself where she can meet her neighbors and not just send the maid. Every morning I'd go out and find fairy rings on the grass. And anyone around here will tell you that means an early winter. And here next door they hadn't even thought to get in coal. I watched every day for Adams and his truck because I knew for a fact that cellar was empty of coal. All I had to do was lean down a little when I was in my garden and I could see right into the cellar, just as swept and clear as though they were planning to treat their guests in there. Jane thought they were the kind who went off on a trip somewhere in the winter, shirking responsibilities for facing the snow with their neighbors. The cellar was all you could see, though. They had those green curtains pulled so tight against the windows that even right up close there wasn't a chink to look through from outside, and them inside dancing away? I do wish I could have nerved myself to go right up to that front door and knock some night. 
Now, Mary Corn thought I ought to. You got a right, Addie, she told me one day in the store. You've got every right in the world to make them quiet down at night. You're the nearest neighbor they got, and it's the right thing to do. You tell them they're making a name for themselves around the village. Well, I couldn't nerve myself, and that's the gracious truth. Every now and then I'd see little Mrs. West walking in the garden, or Mally the maid coming out of the woods with the basket, gathering acorns, never a doubt of it. But I never so much as nodded my head at them. Down at the store I had to tell Mary Corn that I couldn't do it. They're foreigners, that's why, I said. Foreigners of some kind. They don't rightly seem to understand what a person says. It's like they're always answering some other question you didn't ask. If they're foreigners, Dora Powers put in, being at the store to pick up some sugar to frost a cake, it stands to reason there's something wrong to bring them here. Well, I won't call on foreigners, Mary said. You can't treat them the same as you'd treat regular people, I said. I went inside the house, remember? Although not, as you might say, to pay a call. So then I had to tell them all over again about the furniture and the drinking, and it stands to reason that anyone who dances all night is going to be drinking too, and my good donuts from my grandmother's recipe going to the cat. And Dora, she thought they were up to no good in the village. Mary said she didn't know anyone who was going to call, not being sure they were proper. And then we had to stop talking because in came Mally the maid for her chicken. You would have thought I was the chairman of a committee or something, the way Dora and Mary kept nudging me and winking that I should go over and speak to her. But I wasn't going to make a fool of myself twice, I can tell you. Finally, Dora saw there was no use pushing me, so she marched over and stood there until the maid turned around and said, Good morning. Dora came right out and said, There's a lot of people around this village, miss, would like to know a few things. I imagine so, the maid said. We'd like to know what you're doing in our village, Dora said. We thought it would be a nice place to live, the maid said. You could see that Dora was caught up short on that, because who picks a place to live because it's nice? People live in our village because they were born here. They don't just come. I guess Dora knew we were all waiting for her because she took a big breath and asked, And how long do you plan on staying? Oh, the maid said, I don't think we'll stay very long after all. Even if they don't stay, Mary said later, they can do a lot of harm while they're here, setting a bad example for our young folk. Just for instance, I heard that the Harris boy got picked up again by the state police for driving without a license. Tom Harris is too gentle on that boy, I said. A boy like that needs whipping and not people living in a house right in town showing him how to drink and dance all night. Jane came in right then and she had heard that all the children in town had taken to dropping by the house next door to bring dandelions and berries from the woods and from their own father's gardens too, I'll be bound. And the children were telling around that the cat next door could talk. They said he told them stories. Well, that just about did it for me, you can imagine. Children have too much freedom nowadays anyway, without getting nonsense like that into their heads. We asked Annie Lee when she came into the store, and she thought somebody ought to call the police so it could all be stopped before somebody got hurt. She said, suppose one of those kids got a step too far inside that house. How do we know he'd even get out again? Well, it wasn't too pleasant a thought, I can tell you, but trust Annie Lee to be always looking on the black side. I don't have much dealing with the children as a rule. Once they learn, they better keep away from my apple trees and my melons, and I can't say I know one from the next, except for the Martin boy I had to call the police on once for stealing a piece of tin from my front yard. But I can't say I relish the notion that that cat had his eyes on them. It's not natural somehow. And don't you know, it was the very next day that they stole the littlest Acton boy. Not quite three years old, and Mrs. Acton so busy with her garden club, she let him run along into the woods with his sister. And the first thing anyone knew, they got him. Jane phoned and told me. 
She heard from Dora, who had been right in the store when the acting girl came running in to find her mother and tell her the baby had wandered away in the woods, and Mally, the maid, had been digging around not ten feet from where they saw him last. Jane said Mrs. Acton and Dora and Mary Corn and half a dozen others were heading right over to the house next door, and I better get outside fast before I miss something, and if she got there late to let her know everything that happened. I barely got out of my own front door when down the street they came, maybe ten or twelve mothers marching along so mad they never had time to be scared. Come on, Addie, Dory said to me. They've finally done it this time. I knew Jane would never forgive me if I hung back, so out I went and up the front walk to the house next door. Mrs. Acton was ready to go right up and knock because she was so mad. But before she had a chance, the door opened and there was Mrs. West and the little boy, smiling all over as if nothing had happened. Mally found him in the woods, Mrs. West said, and Mrs. Acton grabbed the boy away from her. You could tell that they had been frightening him by the way he started to cry as soon as he got to his own mother. All he would say was, Kitty, and that put a chill down our backs, as you can imagine. Mrs. Acton was so mad she could hardly talk, but she did manage to say, You keep away from my children, you hear me? And Mrs. West looked surprised. Mally found him in the woods, she said. We were going to bring him home. We can guess how you were going to bring him home, Dora shouted. And then Annie Lee piped up from well in the back. Why don't you get out of our town? I guess we will, Mrs. West said. It's not the way we thought it was going to be. Now that was nice, wasn't it? Nothing riles me like people knock in this town where my grandfather built the first house, and I just spoke up right then and there. Foreign ways, I said, your heathen, wicked people, with your dancing and your maid, and the sooner you leave this town, the better it's going to be for you, because I might as well tell you, and I shook my finger right at her that certain people in this town aren't going to put up with your fancy ways much longer, and you would be well advised, very well advised, I say, to pack up your furniture and your curtains and your maid and your cat and get out of our town before we put you out. Jane claims she doesn't think I really said it, but all the others were there and can testify I did, all but Mrs. Acton, who never had a good word to say for anybody. Anyway, right then we found out that they had given the little boy something, trying to buy his affection, because Mrs. Acton pried it out of his hand, and he was crying all the time. When she held it out, it was hard to believe, but of course with them there is nothing too low. It was a little gold-colored apple, all shiny and bright, and Mrs. Acton threw it right at the porch floor as hard as she could, and that little toy shattered into dust. We don't want anything from you, Mrs. Acton said, and as I told Jane afterward, it was terrible to see the look on Mrs. West's face. For a minute, she just stood there looking at us. Then she turned and went back inside and shut the door. Someone wanted to throw rocks through the windows, but as I told them, destroying private property is a crime, and we might better leave violence to the men folk. So Mrs. Acton took her little boy home, and I went in and called Jane. Poor Jane. The whole thing had gone off so fast she hadn't had time to get her corset on. I hadn't any more than gotten Jane on the phone when I saw through the hall window that a moving van was right there next door, and the men were starting to carry out that fancy furniture. Jane wasn't surprised when I told her over the phone, Nobody can get moving that fast, she said. They were probably planning to slip out with that little boy. Or maybe the maid did it with magic, I said, and Jane laughed. Listen, she said, go and see what else is going on. I'll hang on the phone. There wasn't anything to see, even from my front porch, except the moving van and the furniture coming out. Not a sign of Mrs. West or the maid. He hasn't come home from the city yet, Jane said. I can see the street from here. They'll have news for him tonight. And that was how they left. I take a lot of the credit for myself, even though Jane tries to make me mad by saying Mrs. Acton did her share. By that night, they were gone. 
bag and baggage, and Jane and I went over to the house with a flashlight to see what damage they had left behind. There wasn't a thing left in the house, not a chicken bone, not an acorn, except for one blue jay's wing upstairs, and that wasn't worth taking home. Jane put it in the incinerator when we came downstairs. Oh, one more thing. My cat, Samantha, had kittens. That may not surprise you, but it sure as judgment surprised me, and Samantha, her being over eleven years old and well past her kitten days, the old fool, but you would have laughed to see her dancing around like a young lady cat, just as light-footed and as pleased as if she thought she was doing something no cat ever did before. And those kittens troubled me. Folks don't dare come out and say anything to me about my kittens, of course, but they do keep on with that silly talk about fairies and leprechauns. And there's no denying that the kittens are bright yellow with orange eyes and much bigger than normal kittens have a right to be. Sometimes I see them all watching me when I go around the kitchen and it gives me a cold finger down my back. Half the children in town are begging for those kittens. Fairy kittens, they're calling them. But there isn't a grown-up in town would take one. Jane says there's something downright uncanny about those kittens. But then, I may never speak to her again in all my life. Jane even gossips about cats. And gossip is one thing I simply cannot endure. The Beautiful Stranger, published 1968. What might be called the first intimation of strangeness occurred at the railway station. She had come with her children, small John and her baby girl, to meet her husband when he returned from a business trip to Boston. Because she had been oddly afraid of being late, and perhaps even seeming uneager to encounter her husband after a week's separation. She dressed the children and put them into the car at home a long half hour before the train was due. As a result, of course, they had to wait interminably at the station, and what was to have been a charmingly staged reunion, family embracing husband and father, became at last an ill-timed and awkward performance. Small John's hair was must, and he was sticky. The baby was cross, pulling at her pink bonnet and her dainty lace-edged dress, whining. The final arrival of the train caught them in mid-movement, as it were. Margaret was tying the ribbons on the baby's bonnet. Small John was half over the back of the car seat. They scrambled out of the car, cringing from the sound of the train, hopelessly out of sorts. John Sr. waved from the high steps of the train. Unlike his wife and children, he looked utterly prepared for his return, as though he had taken some pains to secure a meeting at least painless, and had, in fact, stood just so, waving cordially from the steps of the train for perhaps as long as half an hour, ensuring that he should not be caught half ready his hand not lifted so far as to overemphasize the extent of his delight in seeing them again. His wife had an odd sense of lost time. Standing now on the platform with the baby in her arms and small John beside her, she could not for a minute remember clearly whether he was coming home or whether they were yet standing here to say goodbye to him. They had been quarreling when he left, and she had spent the week of his absence, determining to forget that in his presence she had been frightened and hurt. This will be a good time to get things straight, she had been telling herself. While John is gone, I can try to get hold of myself again. Now, unsure at last whether this was an arrival or a departure, she felt afraid again, straining to meet an unendurable tension. This will not do, she thought. 
believing that she was being honest with herself. And as he came down the train steps and walked toward them, she smiled, holding the baby tightly against her so that the touch of its small warmth might bring some genuine tenderness into her smile. This will not do, she thought, and smiled more cordially and told him hello as he came to her. Wondering, she kissed him, and when he held his arm around her, the baby for a minute pulled back and struggled, screaming. Everyone moved in anger, and the baby kicked and screamed, No, no, no. What a way to say hello to Daddy, Margaret said, and she shook the baby half amused and yet grateful for the baby's sympathetic support. John turned to Small John and lifted him, Small John kicking and laughing helplessly. Daddy, Daddy, Small John shouted, and the baby screamed, No, no, helplessly, because no one could talk with the baby screaming so. They turned and went to the car. When the baby was back in her pink basket in the car, and Small John was settled with another lollipop beside her, there was an appalling quiet which would have to be filled as quickly as possible with meaningful words. John had taken the driver's seat in the car while Margaret was quieting the baby, and when Margaret got in beside him, she felt a little chill of animosity at the sight of his hands on the wheel. I can't bear to relinquish even this much, she thought. For a week, no one has driven the car except me. Because she could see so clearly that this was unreasonable, John owned half the car, after all. She said to him with bright interest, And how was your trip? The weather? Wonderful, he said. And again she was angered at the warmth in his tone. If she was unreasonable about the car, he was surely unreasonable to have enjoyed himself quite so much. Everything went very well. I'm pretty sure I got the contract. Everyone was very pleasant about it, and I go back in two weeks to settle everything. The stinger is in the tail, she thought. He wouldn't tell it all so hastily if he didn't want me to miss half of it. I am supposed to be pleased that he got the contract and that everyone was so pleasant, and the part about going back is supposed to slip past me painlessly. Maybe I can go with you then, she said. Your mother will take the children. Fine, he said, but it was much too late. He had hesitated noticeably before he spoke. I want to go too, said Small John. Can I go with Daddy? They came into their house, Margaret carrying the baby, and John carrying his suitcase and arguing delightedly with Small John over which of them was carrying the heavier weight of it. The house was ready for them. Margaret had made sure that it was cleaned and emptied of the qualities which attached so surely to her position of wife alone with small children. The toys which small John had thrown around with unusual freedom were picked up. The baby's clothes, no one, after all, came to call when John was gone, were taken from the kitchen radiator where they had been drying. Aside from the fact that the house gave no impression of waiting for any particular people, but only for anyone well-bred and clean enough to fit within its small, trim walls, It could have passed for a home, Margaret thought, even for a home where a happy family lived in domestic peace. She set the baby down in his playpen and turned with the baby's bonnet and jacket in her hand and saw her husband, head bent gravely as he listened to small John. Who? she wondered suddenly. Is he taller? That is not my husband. She laughed and they turned to her, small John curious, and her husband with a quick, bright recognition. She thought, why, it is not my husband, and he knows that I have seen it. There was no astonishment in her. She would have thought perhaps thirty seconds before that such a thing was impossible, but since it was now clearly possible, surprise would have been meaningless. Some other emotion was necessary, but she found at first only peripheral manifestations of one. Her heart was beating violently, her hands were shaking, and her fingers were cold. Her legs felt weak, and she took hold of the back of a chair to steady herself. 
she found that she was still laughing, and then her emotion caught up with her, and she knew what it was. It was relief. I'm glad you came home, she said. She went over and put her head against his shoulder. It was hard to say hello in the station, she said. Small John looked on for a minute and then wandered off to his toy box. Margaret was thinking, this is not the man who enjoyed seeing me cry. I need not be afraid. She caught her breath and was quiet. There was nothing that needed saying. For the rest of the day, she was happy. There was a constant delight in the relief from her weight of fear and unhappiness. It was pure joy to know that there was no longer any residue of suspicion and hatred. When she called him John, she did so demurely, knowing that he participated in her secret amusement. When he answered her civilly, there was, she thought, an edge of laughter behind his words. They seemed to have agreed soberly that mention of the subject would be in bad taste, might even, in fact, endanger their pleasure. They were hilarious at dinner. John would not have made her a cocktail, but when she came downstairs from putting the children to bed, the stranger met her at the foot of the stairs, smiling up at her, and took her arm to lead her into the living room where the cocktail shaker and glasses stood on the low table before the fire. How nice, she said, happy that she had taken a moment to brush her hair and put on fresh lipstick, happy that the coffee table which she had chosen with John and the fireplace which had seen so many fires built by John and the low sofa where John had slept sometimes had all seen fit to welcome the stranger with grace. She sat on the sofa and smiled at him when he handed her a glass. There was an odd, illicit excitement in all of it. She was entertaining a man. The scene was a little marred by the fact that he had given her a martini with neither olive nor onion. It was the way she preferred her martini, and yet he should not have strictly known this. But she reassured herself with the thought that naturally he would have taken some pains to inform himself before coming. He lifted his glass to her with a smile. He is here only because I am here, she thought. It's nice to be here, he said. He had, then, made one attempt to sound like John in the car coming home. After he knew that she had recognized him for a stranger, he had never made any attempt to say words like coming home or getting back. And of course she could not, not without pointing her lie. She put her hand in his and lay back against the sofa, looking into the fire. Being lonely is worse than anything in the world, she said. You're not lonely now? Are you going away? Not unless you come too. They laughed at his parody of John. They sat next to each other at dinner. She and John had always sat at formal opposite ends of the table, asking one another politely to pass the salt and the butter. I'm going to put in a little set of shelves over there, he said, nodding toward the corner of the dining room. It looks empty here, and it needs things, symbols, like. She liked to look at him. His hair, she thought, was a little darker than John's, and his hands were stronger. This man would build whatever he decided he wanted built. We need things together, things we like, both of us, small, delicate, pretty things, ivory. With John, she would have felt it necessary to remark at once that they could not afford such delicate, pretty things, and put a cold finish to the idea. But with the stranger, she said, we'd have to look for them, not everything would be right. I saw a little creature once, he said, like a little tiny man, only colored all purple and blue and gold. She remembered this conversation. It contained the truth like a jewel set in the evening. Much later, she was to tell herself that it was true. John could not have said these things. She was happy. She was radiant. She had no conscience. 
He went obediently to his office the next morning, saying goodbye at the door with a rueful smile and seemed to mock the present necessity for doing the things that John always did. And as she watched him go down the walk, she reflected that this was surely not going to be permanent. She could not endure having him gone for so long every day, although she had felt little about parting from John. Moreover, if he kept doing John's things, he might grow imperceptibly more like John. We will simply have to go away, she thought. She was pleased, seeing him get into the car. She would gladly share with him, indeed give him outright, all that had been John's so long as he stayed her stranger. She laughed while she did her housework and dressed the baby. She took satisfaction in unpacking his suitcase, which he had abandoned and forgotten in a corner of the bedroom, as though prepared to take it up and leave again if she had not been as he thought her, had not wanted him to stay. She put away his clothes, so disarmingly like John's, and wondered for a minute at the closet. Would there be a kind of delicacy in him about John's things? Then she told herself no, not so long as he began with John's wife, and laughed again. The baby was cross all day, but when small John came home from nursery school, his first question was, looking up eagerly, Where is Daddy? Daddy has gone to the office. And again she laughed at the moment's quick, sly picture of the insult to John. Half a dozen times during the day she went upstairs to look at his suitcase and touched the leather softly. She glanced constantly as she passed through the dining room into the corner where the small shelves would be some day and told herself that they would find a tiny little man, all purple and blue and gold, to stand on the shelves and guard them from intrusion. When the children awakened from their naps, she took them for a walk and then, away from the house, returned violently to her former lonely pattern. Walk with the children, talk meaninglessly of daddy, long for someone to talk to in the evening ahead, restrain herself from hurrying home. He might have telephoned. She began to feel frightened again. Suppose she had been wrong. It could not be possible that she was mistaken. It would be unutterably cruel for John to come home tonight. Then she heard the car stop, and when she opened the door and looked up, she thought, No, it is not my husband, with a return of gladness. She was aware from his smile that he had perceived her doubts, and yet he was so clearly a stranger that, seeing him, she had no need of speaking. She asked him, instead, almost meaningless questions during that evening, and his answers were important only because she was storing them away to reassure herself while he was away. She asked him what the name was of their Shakespeare professor in college, and who was that girl he liked so before he met Margaret. When he smiled and said that he had no idea, that he would not recognize the name if she told him, she was in delight. He had not bothered to master all of the past then. He had learned enough, the names of the children, the location of the house, how she liked her cocktails, to get to her. And after that, it was not important, because either she would want him to stay, or she would, calling upon John, send him away again. What is your favorite food, she asked him. Are you fond of fishing? Did you ever have a dog? Somebody told me today, he said once, that he had heard I was back from Boston, and I distinctly thought he said that he heard I was dead in Boston. He was lonely, too, she thought with sadness, and that is why he came, bringing a destiny with him. Now I will see him come every evening through the door and think, this is not my husband, and wait for him, remembering that I am waiting for a stranger. At any rate, she said, you were not dead in Boston, and nothing else matters. She saw him leave in the morning with a warm pride, and she did her housework and dressed the baby. When small John came home from nursery school, he did not ask, but looked with quick searching eyes, and then sighed. 
While the children were taking their naps, she thought that she might take them to the park this afternoon. And then the thought of another such afternoon, another long afternoon with no one but the children, another afternoon of widowhood, was more than she could submit to. I have done this too much, she thought. I must see something today beyond the faces of my children. No one should be so much alone. Moving quickly, she dressed and set the house to rights. She called a high school girl and asked if she would take the children to the park. Without guilt, she neglected the thousand small orders regarding the proper jacket for the baby, whether small John might have popcorn, when to bring them home. She fled, thinking, I must be with people. She took a taxi into town because it seemed to her that the only possible thing to do was to seek out a gift for him, her first gift to him, and she thought that she would find him, perhaps, a little creature all blue and purple and gold. She wandered through the strange shops in the town, choosing small, lovely things to stand on the new shelves, looking long and critically at ivories, at small statues, at brightly colored, meaningless, expensive toys, suitable for giving to a stranger. It was almost dark when she started home, carrying her packages. She looked from the window of the taxi into the dark streets and thought with pleasure that the stranger would be home before her and look from the window to see her hurrying to him. He would think, this is a stranger. I am waiting for a stranger, as he saw her coming. Here, she said, tapping on the glass, right here, driver. She got out of the taxi and paid the driver and smiled as he drove away. I must look well, she thought. The driver smiled back at me. She turned and started for the house, and then hesitated. Surely she had come too far. This is not possible, she thought. This cannot be. Surely our house was white. The evening was very dark, and she could see only the houses going in rows, with more rows beyond them, and more rows beyond that, and somewhere a house which was hers, with the beautiful stranger inside, and she lost out here. Ah, the beautiful stranger who spoiled me for a time, who taught me neons just as nice as afternoon sunshine.